The Reverend Dr. Wayne Fitzgerald Funk, who was the professor of homiletics at the esteemed institution that put up with me for four years as a student, had this way he opened up the preaching classes. And this guy, consider, he was uh, a bit unusual, all right? He was about six foot eight, six foot nine, somewhere in there, the size of a, of, a, of, a, of a defensive lineman. He wasn't a basketball player. He was six, eight, and big. He had a voice that you could hear from here to probably across the street without a microphone. He was intimidating. <laughs> he took his job very seriously in terms of being a preacher. And he said to us in first class, and apparently this is what he did every first class to scare <laughs> the you know what out of you. He said, gentlemen, I will haunt you from the grave if I ever hear any of you ever begin a sermon with these words. If I had been Jesus, <laughs> Wayne, if I had been Jesus, the scriptures would end very differently. The Bible, the last passages that we read of the various gospels, the post-resurrection accounts, would all read differently. Okay, first of all, my first appearance would not have been to my own disciples. Number one on my list, I would have probably appeared to Caiaphas, and I would have scared him to death. I would have gotten him so scared that he would have accused himself of blasphemy from the language he was using. And then I would have paid Pilate a visit, and if I could possibly give you a Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, a few good men moments, he, I would look at him and I would say to him, so you want to know what the truth is? Well, you couldn't handle the truth, because the truth was right in front of you and you couldn't see it. The Roman soldiers and the temple guards who beat me up, I would have had a special loving moment for them. But obviously, as Father Funk said, and as you all know all too, too well, I am not Jesus, I'm only work for him. He had a different approach. He appeared to those who were his closest followers, the one who had all run away. <coughs> and he appeared at a point where they are most in need. They are in a locked room, doing about as much good as no one. It's like if you or I stay in this church, taking what we know of our relationship to Christ and do nothing with it. What's the point? They're in a room that's locked. He appears to strengthen their faith and says to them, you've got to re-engage in ministry. So he does a couple of things. First and foremost, and again, this sermon was born out of a week of being sick. I've been living on NyQuil and black coffee. So if it doesn't follow totally logically, bear with me, and don't knock the diet until you try it, okay? <laughs> First of all, he identifies himself to them, so there's no mistake. This is not an illusion, this is not a wish, this is not a hope. Here I am, look at the signs. Look at the signs of human brutality, and yet I'm here with you. The signs of cowardice, that's you guys, not you personally, those 12. And he comes up and says to them, I've got a mission for you. I've got four gifts for you. And he gives those gifts to them and he gives them to all of us. And I share those four gifts, ask you to reflect upon them. The first thing he says to them consistently, any gospel tradition, the first words out of his mouth when he appears to somebody, he says, peace be with you. The first gift of the risen Christ is peace. They are desperate, they are terrified, they are cowards, they're probably waiting to get arrested. Again, I'm putting myself in someone else's position. <coughs> He wants them to understand that the world, yes, is a dangerous place, and it's an unfair place, and it's a cruel place, and no one is going to appreciate you for the message you're about to give them. But you know what? Peace is not the absence of danger. Peace is the presence of God. Be at peace. In a world that's dominated by fear and cynicism, a world that desperately needs peace, 
Let Christ's peace touch you. Be in his presence. The second gift is purpose. They were lost. They were stuck in that room. They didn't know what to do. Why they were there, no one can quite figure out because logically they should have all run away and gotten out of Jerusalem on the first trip, the first opportunity. But they're there, and they're stuck, and what Jesus says to them, as he says to any of us, look, as the Father sent me, I send you. My work is done in terms of being the presence of the Father. Being the presence of God is now your job, our job, our purpose. Not only to be Christ's representatives in the world, to be the body of Christ in the world, so that anyone could walk in here and feel at home and feel at peace. Now I'm going to tell you a little story of something that happened a week ago. Some of you already know this, I'm being a little redundant, but you need to hear this because it says something about our best aspiration if Christ truly is present here. Last Sunday, just on a whim, with no rhyme or reason, I decided that we needed to have one of our guests, one of the people who normally just maybe comes once a year to church, to come and bring up the gifts of bread and wine. And I picked a person at random. I didn't know later, I got this from Jen Hendren, because Jen and Jim were the ones who were, who were chosen to bring up. She was almost schoolgirl gigglish about this. This is an old woman. She had never been asked, even in her own church, to do something like this. And she was just tickled that someone would ask her. And she was so happy about it. And Monday night, I got the phone call from her husband telling me she had died that day. Okay? She had passed away, had a massive stroke. And one of her memories, her beautiful memories, are the way this liturgy went a week ago. How nice the people were, and how she felt the presence of God. It has nothing to do with me. And in a way, yes, you were here, but it has nothing to do with you either. It is, it is what God working in us can do. We are to be the presence of Christ in the world. And that's about as real as I can make it. I'm not making that up. There are people who already know the story. Ironically enough, she was buried from here yesterday, even though she's not a parishioner, technically. But I think she found God here. And I hope that was through some of you being kind to her as well. There is a power that comes from being part of the presence of God. It is God's Holy Spirit working within us. We don't do it on our own. God's Spirit makes us who we are. And the minute you were baptized, and you were all here last week, you all renewed your baptismal vows, and if you weren't here, you were in some other church, and you did the same thing. You renewed the vows of your baptism. That moment when God's power literally became part of your DNA. So let it shine from you, so that you can, as we sang, follow Jesus. And finally, there is the gift of penance. And for those, maybe you caught, I did peace, purpose, power, and penance. And that's really hard to do on night call and black coffee to come up with those four words to make them rhyme. Or alliterate, anyway. With Christ comes the forgiveness of sins. No matter who we are, no matter what we have done, if we seek his forgiveness and acknowledge our need of him, that forgiveness will be given. And we take the example of somebody who was not in the room. We are told, only in John's Gospel, that when Jesus came and he gave them these gifts and they were overjoyed, there was someone who was not there. We have no idea why he wasn't there. But Thomas was missing. Now maybe they sent him out to Starbucks, okay? Or maybe he was the one smart enough to try to get out and die. We, we don't know. The point is, he comes back, and like most humans, when he hears something that's too good to be true, he doesn't accept it. As most of us with any kind of wisdom usually would. And Jesus then appears to him in his need, in his skepticism. And I get Thomas. He's a cynic. And I totally understand him. And yet Jesus says to him, look, you wanted to see? Here are the signs. I am who I am. Now you can wallow in your doubt. You can remain afraid. You can do nothing. Or you can join the community and let the world know the importance of what I'm offering this world. And that's the same words he says to us. So we come Easter, this beautiful community here on Low Sunday or No Sunday, whichever you want to call it. Receiving God's power, receiving the gift of penitence, receiving the gift of peace, and having a purpose. Now the choice is yours. You can stay in the room, or you can go out and share the gifts you've been given. Amen. Amen. Amen.